So now it's time to present the paper. So the paper is going to be presented by Aditya Ramdas and will be published in the Journal of the Royal Statistical Society Series B during 2023. And his co-author Ian Warby-Smith is here as well and will be available for comments later. Thank you for waiting for it. Thank you, Robin, for the introduction. Thanks all of you for being here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, both in London and in this building. This morning, we went and saw the Kohinoor Diamond. Uh, this afternoon, I'm in the Royal Statistical Society, which I see was founded in 1834. Feels just, you know, historical, magnificent. It's, it's a great pleasure, really. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so yeah, this is a joint work with uh, with Ian. Ian gave the demo talk. So if you don't like my slides, please check his demo talk out online. The slides are, you know, the, the videos there online. And I, I, I think he put in a lot of work into it. So check out his slides. And uh, yeah, so joint work by both of us. And we have had a wonderful time working together. Um, and yeah, we'd be happy to take any comments and questions later on. So uh, what's this paper about? Here's the, you know, high level summary. We present a new solution to four problems. Okay, so the first one is to estimate the mean mu of a distribution P on 0, 1. So this is what we mean by a bounded random variable. We have some distribution that we don't know on 0, 1, and we want to estimate its mean. I'm just going to think, call, call that like the sampling with replacement problem. Um, and the reason I call it that is because the other problem that we address, that we look at, is uh, the sampling without replacement version of the problem, where you just have n numbers in a big bag, and you sample you know, a few of them without replacement. Um, and you want to estimate the mean of those n numbers. And so, you know, th that's uh, that's all that just be represented mu. Okay, so sampling with and without replacement. And what do I mean by estimate? There's two possibilities. So the first one is more standard one, confidence interval. So we want a confidence interval for mu, one minus alpha interval. How do we do that? And the last thing that we do is a confidence sequences for mu. Okay, so I I'll explain on the next slide what a confidence sequence is. But essentially, we do all permutation and combination. So confidence intervals and sequences for that problem, and intervals and sequences for that problem. So kind of kind of one unified framework for for all of these four problems. Now, since most people know what a confidence interval is, but probably don't know what a confidence sequence is, I'll tell you what that is on the next slide. So a confidence sequence for any parameter theta is a sequence of confidence intervals. So in this case, I'm thinking of theta as being real valued. So um, the intervals are just ln, un, some lower bound and upper bound where little n is the sample size. So it's the number of samples that you've seen so far. So you're, you're seeing samples one at a time and uh, you construct this sequence of intervals, but these sequence of intervals have a uniform or, or simultaneous coverage guarantee. So the probability that for all n simultaneously from one to infinity, theta lies in ln un is at least one minus alpha. Okay, so that's, the, that's what a confidence sequence is. It's a simultaneous confidence interval. Um, another equivalent definition, it turns out, is that for any stopping time tau, the probability that theta is in L tau U tau is at least one minus alpha, which means that it's a valid confidence interval even with adaptive stopping. So you can monitor your data, you can stop adaptively, and you still get a valid confidence interval. That's an equivalent definition of a confidence sequence. Now that's a much stronger guarantee that we're asking for than a, what I call a fixed sample confidence interval. This is what we usually teach in statistics. Here, the for all n is outside the probability. So what that means is that you have to fix the sample size n in advance, and you construct one interval, um, and the probability that theta lies in that interval is at least one minus alpha. So uh, the simultaneous coverage guarantee is a much stronger one. Um, and there's another third way of thinking about these, which is um, uh, not wanting to contradict yourself in the future. So let's say that you have n data points and you construct one interval. Uh, it would be nice if after you collect some more data points and you collect, you construct another interval that you don't contradict yourself, which means that these two intervals aren't covering completely different things. But unfortunately, with standard confidence intervals, this will almost surely happen, which means that if you construct a series of normal, just usual confidence intervals, you will contradict yourself with probability one. But with a confidence sequence, you will not. The intersection the, of all your confidence sequences that you can, of the entire confidence sequence will actually be theta, the true parameter with high probability. But with, with confidence intervals, actually, you will contradict yourself repeatedly. So if you desire to not contradict yourself, you essentially are looking for a confidence sequence. So this notion was introduced by Darling and Robbins in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, early 70s, and then kind of went through a lull. It kind of was forgotten for a few decades. And then the bandit community uh, picked it up over the last decade or so. I think over the last decade, these type of con confidence sequences have become more popular. Um, and, and so this paper is about you know, confidence intervals and sequences. Okay, so more formally, here's the first setting. Um, let's say you have x1, x2, and so on. Let's say they're just independent random variables on zero, 1. 
in the paper we relax the independence assumption into a martingale style dependence assumption it's not important for simplicity you can just think about them as being independent maybe even iid if you want on the range 0 1 and they have mean mu okay they have a common mean mu and you know the, the first question is how do you construct a confidence interval for mu it seems like such a simple and basic question uh, and the other question is how do we construct a confidence sequence for mu now for the first question the i would say the first uh, answer uh, that I'm aware of, at least, which was clean and nice, was given by Hofting in a 1963 JASA paper. Hofting said, well, just center your interval at the sample mean. That's what X bar n is. It's the sample mean. And you add and subtract. So the log 2 over alpha, alpha is the level, so 1 minus alpha confidence interval. And uh, n is the sample size, so you know it's like 1 over square root of n makes sense. So you add and subtract this quantity, and he's like, that's the confidence interval you get. Now, uh, that's nice. That's it's nice. nice. Um, so that's nice and it seems to make sense, but um, it does not scale with the variation in the data. So which means that if your data was low variance or high variance, it, it, you know, it, it, it just only depends on the sample mean. It doesn't depend on anything else. And so, um, you know, maybe about 15 years ago, there, there were a few empirical Bernstein confidence intervals that came out. And here's an example of one of them. Here, this one says, I'll still center it to the sample mean, but now I also have a sample variance term. Um, and an extra like one over n term that you uh, that you have to pay. So this is you know, Bernstein style inequality. It's called empirical Bernstein because you don't have to know the true variance. It just depends on the empirical variance of the data. So if the empirical variance is small, this term can be much smaller than what Hoofling gave. And so this is often seen to be a, a better confidence interval. And now what we we'll see is that in this talk, we'll construct even better confidence intervals than these. Now, what about confidence sequences? Um, so the you know the first one again to I think propose it uh, also study confidence sequences Robbins and Cohen around 1970 gave confidence sequences for this problem uh, and they were all based on non-negative super martingales and we'll see you know this term come up a little bit later in this talk um, but uh, in the last decade that idea of constructing non-negative super martingales for this problem has been very popular and uh, many authors Paul Subramani Kaufman Kuhn, Orobona, uh, myself, with my collaborator Steve Howard, we had built uh, many non-negative super martingales for for this type of a problem. But it turns out that the that somehow the right answer is not based on non-negative super martingales; it's based on non-negative martingales. And you can see hints of that right idea in Schaefer and Bohm's textbook, even though they weren't really interested in confidence intervals or confidence sequences or statistical problems. You can you can see uh, hints of the non-negative martingale in their book. Uh, but used for different purposes, like proving the law of class numbers and things of that kind. Um, and uh, Hendrix uh, has a short archive paper in 2018 that we came across later on, which also develops a non-negative martingale that's you know very similar to ours um, in, in the with three placement set. So there's this is like maybe the past work for confidence sequences. So this is for the first setting for sampling with replacement. For sampling without replacement, it looks like as I said, there's n numbers that are just in a bag. These numbers are between zero and one. Uh, you want to estimate the mean of all the numbers, just the, this overall sample mean, um, and you you sample without replacement, which means you put your hand into the bag, you pick out one, and then you don't put it back in, and you do that a few times. And uh, Hoofing in his uh, original paper pointed out that his uh, earlier confidence interval also applied for sampling without replacement. He said exactly the same formula. He said that's also a confidence interval for the without replacement setting, but without when we when we're doing things without replacement, we actually expect to get something better. We, we, we expect to do better than with replacement because after capital N steps, you should have no uncertainty. You have seen all of the data, but this will still have some uncertainty, so it's not really the right answer. Um, but then, um, there were, you know, surfling in 1970s, Bardane and Maillard in 2015, they studied this problem further and did come up with Bernstein type confidence intervals. But what we'll see is that uh, our betting style confidence intervals are, uh, they, they actually perform much, much better in practice. Um, and then for confidence sequences, nobody's maybe explicitly looked at confidence sequences, but uh, the dual problem to confidence sequences is sequential tests. And so um, th there was some work by Kaplan in the 1970s that Stark, Philip Stark over the last decade has kind of resurrected, and that was based on non-negative martingales. And, and so you know there's a hint of, uh, of that which will be in, in our work as well. But I will not, the reason that this background is a little dark now, it's actually great, is that I'm going to not really have time to talk about without replacement. I'll just let you see the paper for, for details. Uh, I'll just talk about the with replacement problem just for reasons of time. Okay, so as I mentioned before, for all four versions, we present a new solution. Um, it's unified. 
and it performs really well in theory and practice. By what I mean by that is we can prove interesting bounds theoretically for it that have not been proven yet for, for you know for this class of problems before. And when you actually run these things, they work well out of the box and they, they you know you get excellent confidence in terms of theorems in practice. And maybe another contribution that we do is we really relate it to the much broader literature on the topic. Uh, it seems like people have been beating around this bush from different literatures, from information theory, from you know probability, from statistics, from online learning. Um, and, uh, and and so yeah, so we would, we tried our best, especially in the appendix. We have a long historical section where we we try to lay connections of this to going back to Veal in 1939, but also recent work in online learning on this field. Okay, so that's what we did. Now, um, now how how do we do it? Like there's a um, uh, before I tell you that you know the actual algorithm that we use, I have to actually convince you that it's worth listening to. That that maybe this is actually. Worth your time. So let me show you a figure to convince you that this is, uh, you know, so it's only the width replacement setting from now on. Now, in the first line is confidence sequences. The second line is confidence intervals. The distribution is exactly the same. Of course, this is a non-parametric estimation problem, which means, what do I mean by non-parametric? We know nothing about the distribution except that it's on the range 0, 1. So it could be discrete, continuous, mixed. It could be anything. I have no idea what it is. Um, and so it's a very rich class of uh, methods. So it's a non-parametric problem. But when you run simulations, you still have to pick a distribution to run your simulation on it. So that's the distribution. So in this case, this, this is the PDF. This is the beta 1030. Uh, that's the data. That's what we get. But of course, the method doesn't know it. But you know, for simulations, this is what we do. Um, and on this, uh, on the second plot, both for the confidence sequence and the interval, the x-axis is the sample size in log scale. So you know, so 1,000 samples, 10,000 samples, and so on. Um, and the y-axis is the actual confidence bound uh, between 0 and 1. Uh, and the dotted gray line in the middle is the true mean. So beta 1030, the mean is 0.25. So the dotted blue uh, gray line on there is at 0.25. Um, and what you're seeing is various confidence intervals that have been constructed. So for example, um, the orange line is the Hoofding 1963 confidence interval. The uh, the purple line is the empirical Bernstein one from Maurer and Pontil. And the green dotted line is our betting-based confidence interval. And you can see that the improvement, this is width against sample size. If you don't want to look at this plot, this is just the width. Our width is significantly smaller from extremely small sample sizes onwards. And if you actually look at the intervals, the intervals are themselves much smaller um, visually. The same for confidence sequences that you, you actually see a visible gap to prior work. And uh, these are a few methods, but as you'll see in later plots, we implement many, many methods in the literature. And, and this is the typical takeaway take message is that it performs really well in practice. So given that it performs so well, given that it's such a basic problem that 70 years ago, or no, 60 years ago, Hoofding studied in 1963, and many people in many fields have studied, how is it possible that there was something more to be done and, and this big of an improvement avail available to be made? Um, and the answer is that it, it relies on, on betting. It relies on converting the problem into a game. Okay, so um, you got to throw away a lot of what you think about as traditional statistical training uh, in terms of how you construct confidence intervals and instead let's play games instead. It's more fun, so why not let's play games? So what's the game? Uh, we're going to make up this game. It's an imaginary game. Uh, we, are, we, the statistician, are playing a game against nature. Nature is providing the data and we are going to be betting against nature. So uh, in, in this, this game, uh, there's actually not going to be one game. There's going to be many games. We're going to play uh, games indexed by little m. And uh, m is in the range 0 to 1. So this is really a continuum of games that we're playing. And in every one of these games, we start off with $1. So K0M just means in the mth game, um, at time 0, I'm going to start off with $1. This is a fake dollar. It's a, it could be a pound. I know I'm the wrong statistics. So it's, you start off with one pound. Um, and at each time step, uh, this is the sequence of things that happens. Uh, for each M, the statistician declares a bet. Okay, and the bet uh, is going to be denoted lambda mp. So in the mth game at time t, I produce a bet lambda. And lambda is in some range, like, you know, the, the reason for that range, uh, you can think of it as minus one to one for simplicity. The reason for that range will become clear later. Uh, but what it, uh, I'll tell you what it roughly means, but that's your bet. And then reality reveals xt. Okay, you see, you see the actual data. And then um, the statistician's uh, wealth gets updated according to their bet and reality in the following way. Um, uh, in the mth game, at time their wealth after t steps uh, is their wealth after t minus 1 steps multiplied by this multiplicative factor. So this multiplicative factor is 1 plus lambda times xt minus m. Okay, so roughly what's going on is if um, uh, 
if the statistician thinks that the mean of x t is larger than n, if this is what the statistician thinks is that I think the mean is larger than n, then they will try to set lambda as positive, as greater than zero, so that this product is kind of positive in expectation and their wealth goes up. If the statistician thinks that the mean of x t is actually less than m, then they will try to set lambda negative, and so that you know negative times negative, you, your wealth goes up. But if the statistician is wrong, meaning they placed a positive bet, but xt turned out to be less than m, then the statistician loses money. Okay, so this, this multiplicative factor will be less than one and they've lost some money. Um, the reason that these bounds exist is so that you don't bet more than you have. This, uh, your wealth can never become negative. It's, this, is, this remains non-negative. xt minus m is in the range of, it can be at most one minus m and at least minus m. And so this is just ensuring that the product remains non-negative. So if you if you're worried about why that weird thing is going on, it's just non-negativity. So you, the, the direction of the bet tells you uh, it's larger or smaller than n. The magnitude tells you the confidence in some sense. How, how sure are you that it's actually larger or smaller than n? And then that's it. That's the end. That's the game. And this is the confidence interval. So the confidence interval or the confidence sequence is just the set of games in which you did not make enough money. Okay, so you're playing, you're playing all these games. In the games in which, let's say, let's say alpha is 0.05, one over alpha is 20. So you start off with one pound. You're trying to reach 20 pounds. The games in which you haven't yet reached 20 pounds, that's your confidence interval. That's it. So the construction is super simple. You write down the game, you have your confidence interval, you're done. Okay. So I, I'm going to explain to you on the next slide why this is the confidence interval. Why does this have any guarantee whatsoever? But the construction itself is, is simple. You're playing games, you're making bets. You're making money in some games. You're losing money in some games. Um, and then the games in which you've not yet made enough money is uh, that's your confidence set. Okay, so let's explain why. Okay, so roughly what's going on is each game M is testing a null hypothesis that the mean equals M, that the uh, expected value of Xi given the bus actually equals M. So it's testing that null hypothesis. And uh, and so if you look at the form of the, the wealth process, you, know, you can write it as a multiplicative form as I showed you earlier, or you can just write it as a product. It's a product of your wealth multipliers at every step of the game. Um, and this was the confidence set that I said you had. So I said, here's your wealth process. Here's the confidence set, that mean confidence sequence, um, uh, satisfies this guarantee. Now I've written the confidence sequence as miscoverage. The probability that there exists any time at which you don't cover mu is at most alpha. So I've written it as a miscoverage statement, that's fine. Now the proof is really one line long. Okay, so here's the proof. There's one special wealth process in all of these. You're playing many games. One of these games is special. It's the one that's indexed by mu. You don't know which game that is. You're playing many of them. You don't know mu. But in that specially indexed game, that wealth process is a non-negative martingale. So k mu t is a non-negative martingale with initial value 1. Initial value 1 is obvious because I started off with a dollar. It's non-negative because I never bet more than I had. So it's non-negative. So the only thing you need to think about is why is it a martingale? And the idea of why it's a martingale is because if I plug in mu in terms of m, uh, this entire thing becomes mean 1. I'm just multiplying by mean 1 because if xi is mean mu, then xi minus mu is mean 0. And so this whole thing is mean 1. And so it's really like I'm just going 1 times 1 times 1 in expectation. That's what's going on. So that's, that's what a martingale is. And so k mu t is the non-negative martingale. Now there's a fantastic inequality called Beale's inequality. Everybody should know this inequality. It's, it, it improves on Markov's inequality. Um, and it's a time uniform version of Markov's inequality. So Markov's inequality says I have a non-negative random variable. The probability that it's larger than one over alpha is at most alpha. It's a non-negative random variable with expectation one. Um, but Beale's inequality says that that's true actually uniformly over time. If you have a non-negative martingale, the probability that its entire path ever crosses one over alpha is at most alpha. That's Beale's inequality. And in English, what that means is uh, you see that your confidence set you're constructing, this confidence set, it's only incorrect if you if you missed mu, which means that k mu t happens to be larger than 1 over alpha. But I'm telling you that the probability that k mu t is larger than 1 over alpha is at most alpha. So your type 1 error is at most alpha. So it's literally, so martingale, wheels inequality, confidence sequence, you're done. So it's uh, it's very clean and crisp in some sense. So now the question is, how should we bet? What I've told you is, you know, if you bet this way or that way, you know, you, you, you try to bet positive for if you're larger than M, if you try to bet negative, if you're less than M, but you don't know what the true mean is. So 
you need an automated way of betting. So here's one answer. This we call it Grappa. I, I, I not a coincidence, but um, <laughs> but I do have a full form for it, which is if, if the growth rate adapted to the particular alternative. And uh, there's there's a reason behind it in the paper. But roughly, this is what it looks like. So um, the idea is that uh, you know in the game which is indexed by mu, you cannot make money. Um, because your wealth is a martingale. But in the games that are not indexed by mu, you can make money. And in fact, your wealth can grow exponentially. Um, you can make a lot of money. And so the idea is I want to maximize the rate of growth of that exponent. And so I'm going to take the log of that multiplier. So this multiplier is, you know, it's, it's coming from the wealth that I was multiplying. But I don't want to maximize the expected multiplier. I want to maximize the expected log of the multiplier because I want to maximize the exponent as my as my wealth grows exponentially. That's exactly what's going on. Um, and I want to pick the lambda that maximizes that rate of growth. Okay, now I've seen the first t minus one steps. That's f t minus one is the filtration after t minus one steps. I've seen t minus one rounds of the game. I have to decide in the uh, in the teeth round what do I do. Okay, and so. Um, and, and so this is what I'm going to, I'm going to maximize lambda with respect to this. But now I don't know p. The distribution p appears here as this expectation. I don't know p. But you know, nevertheless, what you can do is this is an optimization problem. What do you do when you see an optimization problem? What I do is I differentiate and I set it equal to zero. So that's what I did. So like you differentiate, and that's the KKT conditions. You do a simple Taylor expansion, and you get uh, this uh, plug-in estimate for lambda lambda t. Okay, and I'll, I'll tell you why it makes sense. So. Um, what a plug-in estimate is in the numerator is the sample mean minus m divided by the sample variance and sample mean minus m the whole square. So lastly, what this is saying is if your sample mean so far was larger than m, then bet positive. If your sample mean was less than m, then bet negative. Your denominator has the sample variance. It's saying if your variance is large, be conservative. If your variance was very small, be aggressive. So if you're if you're seeing very low variation variation data then you, you should bet more aggressively because you're more sure of what the mean is. So um, this is a very natural, this is a, this is a Kelly style bet. It's a mean over variance kind of style bet. It, it, uh, uh, but that's, that's actually the first thing we tried and it, it really does work uh, nicely in practice. In the paper we have, I, I call that option one. In the paper we have other betting strategies based on online Newton step or sequentially rebalancing portfolios. There's many, really many variations in, in the paper, but Here's one that I find easy to describe. And, and if you actually ran, ran this, it, it would work well out of the box. So here's, uh, if you want to visualize what the bets look like, here's two different examples. Again, this is time on the x-axis. And the y-axis is uh, is now the range of lambda. Lambda is your bets. And uh, on the left is Bernoulli one half. So let's say the data is actually coming from Bernoulli half, the mean is zero. Um, here on the right, the data is coming from beta one one. Again, the, sorry, the mean is half. And again, the mean is half on both sides. Um, and what I'm showing you is five different lambda sequences. These are our bets as a function of time. And so what you see is the bets fluctuate early on and then stabilize. In, and they fluctuate a little bit on and then they stabilize. Now, these are five different games. When I'm playing against m is equal to 0.3, m is equal to 0.5, m is equal to 0.7. You know, so these are just five different games and showing you in those games, how do the bets change? The most sensible one is the green one, which is 0.5. The, the bets stabilize to zero. It basically says, you're not going to make money in this game, so don't bother betting. So lambda is just zero, uh, you don't bet. When, when, uh, when you're playing against 0.7, the true, like M is large, so the true mean is less than M. So you want to bet negative. And so you end up, uh, you, you end up learning, you know, in this case, minus 1.6, or in this case, minus 0.6. Why is there a difference? Because this is a low variance distribution, so you can bet more aggressively. This is a high variance distribution. You bet more conservatively, and so yeah. So you can kind of plot this out and see that okay, it's, it's actually doing something sensible. Uh, here we show this is the actual wealth growth. If m is equal to mu, your wealth is a martingale and it doesn't really grow. But if m is greater than mu or m is much greater than mu, you're looking at let's say the mean is 0.5 and you're playing the game indexed by 0.6 or by 0.9, your wealth will grow exponentially fast. And it doesn't really matter which strategy you use in all of these strategies your wealth grows exponentially fast. So it really does do well in practice. So here's a few more plots to show that you know, it, it does well. Here we're comparing against Benck's confidence intervals uh, and Anderson's confidence intervals. So many people have studied this problem and kind of in all of them, you see that our uh, betting-based green dotted confidence interval is the one that's really at the bottom. Um, it, it seems to do well across the board. Um, 
maybe one thing i want to highlight about our confidence intervals is their second order tightness so um, you can prove that if the data is actually iid then the width of our confidence intervals root n times the width of the confidence interval converges to this quantity where sigma is the true variance of the data you don't know the true variance of the data but your confidence interval automatically seems to adapt to it okay and this is a first order statement um, this is exactly what bernstein's inequality gives for known sigma so if you knew sigma you would actually get Bernstein's inequality to sigma by root n times times exactly that constant factor. And so you can think about our method as being an empirical Bernstein inequality. But what we show in some upcoming work is that this is a first order correctness, but actually uh, the width of our confidence interval matches the width of Bernstein's inequality even in the second order term. So there's Bernstein's inequality has a one over n term and it matches those constants also. So the, you know, the, the error uh, between our empirical Bernstein and Bernstein is actually smaller order than one over n. So uh, it's, a, it's really tight and essentially cannot be improved, I think. Now I'm going to like uh, just back off a little bit to say this game that, I, that we played, you know, I didn't make up this game. Like this game was actually intrinsic to this problem and it's actually intrinsic to many problems, but this particular problem, and why is that? So this was the, the martingale that we had. Here's an amazing fact. We used a one directional implication. We said, well, if X has mean mu, then that process is a non-negative martingale. But it turns out that, well, we call it a test martingale. But um, it turns out this is an if and only if statement. This, this quantity here, this process is a non-negative martingale with initial value one, if and only if your data has conditional mean mu. And so um, you, you can, you know, this capital process being a non-negative martingale, which is the only thing we used for validity. That's the only fact that we used. It's not an implication of the problem statement. It's actually logically equivalent to the problem statement. Instead of telling me, Aditya, here are a bunch of bounded random variables with mean mu, you could have said, Aditya, this is a non-negative martingale with initial value one. And you have told me the same thing. So, uh, so there was always a game hidden in the problem and we just brought out that game and we didn't, we didn't really make it up. And it turns out that that's not true just for this problem in this particular paper. It's actually true for a lot of other non-parametric problems, independence testing, two sample testing, heavy tailed estimation. We have now done it in several other settings. We can actually prove that any time valid inference must depend on capital processes. This is a, there's a universality underlying all of these. And this, you know, this was, uh, we're, we're getting, this was an example of a more general phenomenon. Um, now, there's other things in the paper that I won't have time to discuss. So again, I said closed form empirical Bernstein confidence sequences that are uh, accurate to the second order, uh, many more betting strategies and simulations, sampling without replacement, as I mentioned, a historical review, which connects it to information and coding theory, to game theory and probability, to churn off bounds, which is a, maybe a more classical way of solving this problem. Um, and maybe something interesting, which is a universal representation of non-negative martingales for any problem, not just for our problem, all non-negative martingales for any uh, set of distributions that P, they must look like the one that we have. They must look like product of one plus lambda times Z, where Z has mean zero um, and lambda is you know, in some range and predictable, it must have that form. So this was not a coincidence. And, and if you're working with non-negative martingales, you're, you have to be working with things of that kind. Um, depending on how much time left, do I have five minutes left to end with a bigger picture? Oh, I do. It's, it's, Oh, I do. Great. Excellent. So let me step back a little bit from, from uh, you know, I think if I just focused on this paper, it would do you a disservice because there's something more fundamental going on, which I think people would be interested to know about. Well, this paper was not a fluke, uh, some accident of chance. There's something more fundamental with games going on. So these test martingales or non-negative martingales, they are actually non-parametric composite generalizations of likelihood ratios. So for 100 years since Fisher, who was not in this room, but in a nearby room, um, you know, uh, likelihood ratios have been a cornerstone of statistics, whether it's parametric statistics or, you know, whether you're frequentist or your Bayesian, even Bayesian statistics, likelihood ratios are front and center. But non-parametric statistics has not had that kind of a, maybe a, a unifying theme as much. In, in particular, in this problem, non-parametric, you know, it's a non-parametric problem. There's no reference measure meaning that because you have discrete distributions and continuous distributions and everything in between, there is no single common reference measure to define likelihood ratios between pairs of bounded random variables. And, and so you think, I can't even think about applying a likelihood ratio style method to this problem. But it turns out that are non-parametric generalizations of likelihood ratios. Okay, and so 
I, I've been using this word test martingale before, so just make it a little bit more formal. Um, a process M is called a test martingale for a class of distributions script P, like a non potentially non parametric class. If it's non negative, MT is greater than zero. And it's a martingale, so the expected value of MT given the past is actually MT minus one. And this must be true for every distribution in that class for all times. So we call it a test martingale for P. So we prove this result in, a, you know, in another paper that. If you have a test martingale for script P, then you can write your martingale as a likelihood ratio for every P in your class. So for every P, there exists a Q such that your M looks like a likelihood ratio. So when I was working with these non-negative martingales, I was implicitly working with likelihood ratio. That's actually why this method does so well. It's based on likelihood ratios, but we don't know how to define likelihood ratios for non parametric problems. So we use non-negative martingales instead. So yeah, you know, so non-negative martingales are likelihood ratios in disguise. So every likelihood ratio is a test martingale, but also every test martingale is implicitly a likelihood ratio. This, this basically means that, you know, test martingales are at the heart of parametric inference that we know, but also of non-parametric inference. It gives us a way of working with likelihood ratios without being able to have likelihood ratios, without having reference measures. Um, there's something else which we call e-processes, which generalize test martingales. So there are problems there are classes of distribution script P for which no, you know, the only test martingale is a constant, but you can relax the definition of a test martingale to define something called an E process, and those exist more generally. And so you'll find a bunch of us are very excited these days about E processes, and the reason is they are a proxy for likelihood ratios, and, and somehow they are the right way of solving many non parametric problems. So uh, we call this area game theoretic statistics. So what is game theoretic statistics? It's a subfield of statistics whose quest is to quantify uncertainty in, in statistical inference tasks like testing or estimation or forecasting or model selection or change detection by using game theoretic intuition, language, and uh, formalism. Um, and uh, this helps us design new uh, non parametric inference procedures like the ones I described um, that they often have stronger theoretical guarantees under weaker conditions. In this case, it turns out that the dependence assumptions of the data are weak but also you can track your data adaptively and stop and it gives you some kind of flexibility. Uh, so in, in applications, it turns out the IT industry, this is very useful to be able to track your data as it comes in. Um, it actually also combines the use of prior knowledge with frequentist guarantees. When you bet, you are allowed to be Bayesian if you want to. You can say, well, I have, I have this kind of prior knowledge. I know this about coins or I know this about the data, whatever it is, you can use your prior. But um, in the end, the guarantees are frequentist. So your betting strategy can be Bayesian, but the guarantees that come out of frequentist. There's some sense in which this melds uh, a, a Bayesian and frequentist way of thinking, because when you want to prove things to the rest of the world, using your prior sometimes is not convincing to other people. But when you use your prior to bet, you're effectively betting out of sample, and your performance out of sample is convincing to anybody else. So it has, a, it has a frequentist guarantee, even if people don't like your prior or don't care for your prior, the evidence is in the wealth that you've made. And and uh, and that really comes with uh, a much stronger guarantee. And the last thing is when you play games, you don't design a strategy ahead of time and blindly play a game. When you're playing chess or any other game, you adapt to the opponent. If your if your opponent is naive, you play aggressively. If your opponent is an expert, you might play very conservatively. So if you're looking for estimators or techniques that adapt to the difficulty of the problem, especially non-parametric problems, then you know writing it as a game and playing that game is a very natural way of doing this because Good strategies are always automatically adapted to the difficulty of the problem. Um, if you want, you can ignore all the games and the bets and you can just call it a non-negative super martingale approach to statistics, but I don't like this. It removes a lot of intuition that guides me and several others in this room. And I think there's a lot of philosophical reasons why we really want to keep the game in there because it makes a lot of this actually intuitive. It's not, it's not analytics, it's actually intuition. Um, and the core idea um, was in a JRSSA discussion paper by Schaefer, it's testing by betting. I, this is really a summary of what I described, but it's, 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 maybe it's a good summary. If you want to test a null hypothesis, you set up a game such that if the null hypothesis is true, then no strategy can make money in that game. And if the null hypothesis is false, then a good betting strategy can make a lot of money in that game. So wealth in the game is then a direct measure of evidence against the null. And every strategy of the statistician corresponds to a different estimator or test statistic. So just like there are good and bad strategies for playing the game, just like there are good and bad estimators or test statistics. So testing and estimation is just transformed into game and strategy design. 
And so designing good games and strategies for other problems is basically a, a research program that me and others in this room have been pursuing. And, and I think there's much more to be done because it's a relatively new way of looking at testing and estimation. Um, so a few technical concepts I mentioned, you know, confidence sequences. The probabilistic tools you need to know are very few, just non-negative martingales, uh, their generalizations. And the bridge between the probabilistic tool of a non-negative martingale and what you want, like a confidence sequence or a test, the bridge is views inequality or optional stopping theorem. There's essentially only two real tools. So everything comes out you know, quite, quite, uh, quite cleanly. There's not many things you need to know to, to, to do research in this area. Um, and then if you want to learn more, we have a course that Glenn Schaefer, Rodo, and I taught during we turned the Zoom curse into a Zoom blessing. Uh, this was a PhD class taught across three universities in parallel on Zoom. So there's lecture slides and stuff available. The, 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 you know, it's available from my from my website if you want to know more about game theoretic statistics. Um, uh, Peter and I organized a workshop last summer uh, in the Netherlands, a week-long workshop on this topic. And now uh, in May next year with Johanna Ziegel and Joe Duvang, we are organizing at Oberwolf Park next year. So if you're interested and you're in Europe, maybe you know you might want to pop by. Um, and we have a survey with Borodia Volk uh, and, and, and Glenn and Peter um, on this topic, which will hopefully appear in statistical science uh, later this year. So again, these are just, if you if you find this intriguing and you say, I want to know more than bounded random variables, I want to know it for other problems, check out this survey in which we describe, you know, several other problems and put the literature in one place. Uh, and last, we, we, we have a special issue coming out on this topic, again, co-edited by, by Peter and me. So with that, I'd like to thank my, my co-author, Ian, once again. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with him. Um, thank all of you for being here, those online and, and here in the room. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and hand it over to back to Robin. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aditya. I'd now like to call on Peter Grunwald from CWI Amsterdam in the Netherlands to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I did send you a new version of the slides. If it's too late, then we'll just do the slides. And yeah, I think that's too late. But too late, okay. Yeah, well, it's no problem. So you can see. Um, in the details, the uh, pointer, if you want to. Uh, okay. Okay. Yes. okay, so um, I'm going to say a few words on uh, learning a mean in a, in a mean way, and why I call it like that, you will see in a moment. Uh, so first of all, I should apologize for the quality of my slides. You might have heard something here, and the reason is normally one should never excuse oneself, but actually the moment this meeting started was also the, the deadline of the ERC advanced grants, like the same minute. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, so, um, and then there is one more thing. So I, I'm really like to uh, thank the Royal Statistical Society very much. And I guess in particular, uh, Heather for inviting me here. And I have to say a little bit before I start, because way back when in the 90s, when I was a PhD student, it really feels like very long time ago. That's when you had to go to the library to get papers. And you went to the library to get a paper from the uh, JRSS Series B. And then you saw these things like that. There was someone uh, in the chair and there was a vote of thanks and uh, acclamation. Well, I don't know if we'll have that here, but um, and uh, all that. And I was like, oh, wow, I want to be there. I want to see that. It was like the room where Fisher and Nyman uh, and Pearson were in. And uh, and so now I'm here and I and this is like uh, uh, a child's dream come true after 25 years or so. So thank you, um, Heather. Um, and uh, there is one more thing then, and then I'll start for real. Uh, one more note, I think you should know that Aditya Ramdas uh, actually exactly one week ago, uh, it was announced that he has won the Peter Kevin Hall IMS Early Career Prize for basically what he's been talking about today. Um, and I would like to also uh, especially remark what is said there, the potential to shape the future of statistics. Um, so I want to say a little bit uh, about, uh, first a little bit uh, about um, the, uh, let's say, basically when you talked, you talked about this lambda and how do you learn if you, basically if you don't know the mean, what do you do? So you somehow learn it from data and uh, use a method called uh, grappa. And um, after I'm going to talk about that, I'm going to say a little bit about the lean, mean and lean thing. Um, so what is interesting here from my perspective is that uh, there seem to be 
so we've heard a lot about uh, super martingales for betting, and you can use them to make uh, uh, these confidence sequences. Uh, or e-processes, think of e-processes as confidence, uh, as, as super martingales here. Uh, these things which have uh, expectations bound by one given the past, and you multiply them. There seem to be two general ways of constructing them. On one hand side, there's what we've seen here. There's if, if you have bounded outcomes, you take one plus lambda times an outcome minus a mean. Uh, and that clearly has expectation one, which is what you need. Uh, but another thing, and that's how actually uh, we, my group at CWI, got into this, is uh, via uh, likelihood ratios. Right? If you want to test uh, a simple versus simple, then uh, obviously the likelihood ratio uh, gives you exactly what you need. Um, uh, uh, and that is because if you look at the expectation of this thing under the null, which is your null hypothesis, uh, that's one, and if you condition on the past, that the conditional expectation given the past is also always one, because if you take an expectation under the null, you have an expectation on the null of a likelihood ratio, if you write out the expectation, the null, this, the null density scans, so you get an integral of a P1, which is one. So you get something with expectation one, and that's how we came to this thing, and we were actually in the beginning very surprised that there were these other people who were coming with this one plus lambda things. For us, likelihood ratios were kind of the thing to look at. Uh, now, with likelihood ratios, uh, the next question, of course, what if you test composite hypotheses, which would amount to having nuisance parameters, uh, if you do confidence intervals? Um, and then uh, what we found uh, was, uh, which I still, after four years, still think is kind of really surprising, um, that there is something you can do here, and it is the following. So suppose your null is composite. Let's still assume a simple uh, alternative. Uh, and let's make things simple. It works a lot more generally, but to make the uh, connection to LHS and EFS paper, we want to keep it simple. Suppose that if you minimize over the null the KL divergence between the alternative and the null, suppose that the minimum is achieved, uh, you get the same minimum if you take the convex well, you cannot make things smaller. If that happens, um, and if they are IID according to all hypotheses, uh, then uh, the grow e process, the grow of supermarketing that you can get here, grow means growth rate optimal, is again given by a likelihood ratio. It's P1 divided by a special thing in the null, um, which is actually the thing which minimizes this distance. Uh, so it's actually not at all obvious that this would give you. A martingale, like a betting strategy, because for that to happen, the expectation of this thing has to be one, and you can take the expectation under everything in a null, not just under this thing pre-start, right? For it to be a martingale, expectation has to be one under everything in a composite null, but that is the case. It's the main theorem uh, of our paper, and it's not just any um, non-negative martingale. It's uh, this thing, if you look at it as a random process at time n, it maximizes the logarithm of the alternative, which makes it an instance of something called Kelly betting uh, in economics. And in some sense, that's maximizing the logarithm on, on the alternative is a very good idea. In the long run, it will maximize your capital if the null is false. Know that if the null is false, we want to get rich. We just said that too. And this will be in the long run the best thing if you get more and more data. Um, so uh, now if the alternative is also composite, then what we can do is basically we cannot we do, if the alternative is true let's be very frequent this year then there will be some element in the alternative from which the data are sampled uh, and we would like to have to grow uh, um, the grow process relative to that uh, to that alternative so there is some special q which is true and we would like to uh, basically if we know what it was we could use this non-negative martin deal which is like the light to face with this KL minimizing thing here. But we don't know Q. So what we can do instead then, if we can learn it, for example, in a Bayesian way by putting a prior on it, um, and then at each point in time, we use the base predictive given the past, and we project always the base predictive to the null. And we get a valid marching yield, because for validity, you only need, uh, it doesn't matter what the alternative is, but it will get closer and closer to this growth thing. So it's relatively grow, not grow itself, but you want to be close to grow, no matter what the actual alternative is, right? So <clears throat> this is kind of one of the main ideas in uh, our paper, which actually goes back to 2019, but it took a long way before we submitted it. Uh, it's actually older than your paper, 
uh, but now it also has been accepted and uh, there will also be a meeting in this very room about this paper soon. Um, so now we have this mystery, like are these two things, uh, they look very different, right? The two, two constructions. But uh, so what I recently realized, I kind of, we have knew it, we've talked about it before, is that uh, these things are actually a lot more similar than you would think. Uh, essentially, you could say that uh, what uh, Ian and Aditya have shown us here, this grappa method, is essentially the same as the relative grow method. It's just that if you, so the grow method was designed for per, this relative grow method, what we had in microparametric cases. Uh, and then what you do if you have a K parameter model in the alternative, you put a prior on that. And basically what you lose compared to an Oracle, which knows the true alternative is logarithmic in the sample size. Time, it's number of parameters over two times log n. That's the same thing as in the BIC formula. Uh, it's basically what you get if you do a Taylor expansion of the base marginal. So the cost is one half log for not knowing a parameter is one half log n in the parametric case. And here you get you actually get the same thing. So for the grappa, you actually did not really use a prior, but he did something very similar. Uh, and it will also, I think if you do it right, I don't know if the grappa will actually give you that, but I think you will also get this one half log n because you have only one parameter, one free parameter. So. Uh, my message here is that if you look at uh, our papers, it has been accepted now and uh, Grumpa and also other things, for example, in the machine learning literature, in the Bennett literature, there's something called KL-INF. And there are some papers by Orobona on something he calls coin betting. All these three methods do actually very much the same thing. So there's unification. So that was the technical part. And then I want to say one more thing, uh, and I have to be careful in this room. Almost done. Okay, yeah, I can manage that. Um, well, all these people have passed away. Um, but uh, so, uh, if we put this like a look at the bigger picture, like why are we are all doing this, uh, um, organizing these workshops, uh, so enthusiastic about it. Um, so I really think I, I am really not happy with statistics as it exists, basically. And if you look at the kind of the Walt Nyman Pearson theory, uh, that's really based on perfect a priori knowledge about like the sampling plan, like uh, what is your sample size, or at least what is your rule for stopping. You have to know that in advance. It cannot be imposed on you while you are sampling, while while you are doing uh, your analysis. You also have to know what is your loss function, or in testing, what is your alpha. We all know that this is a big problem, right? If you have a very small p value, but you had a big alpha, what do you do? How do you use the information in the small p value? So I have a recent paper where I show actually, so what we've seen today, we already see that these uh, confidence sequences and general um, martingale approaches um, that they deal with this problem, right? Because you can stop at any time you like when the data look nice or when somebody tells you to stop and still you get something valid. It doesn't matter how you got there. You can also use the same techniques to uh, have decision tasks like loss functions, which can depend on your data or can also be imposed by somebody from outside who says, well, uh, now you've analyzed the data, now I want you to do this loss function. And that other person might have seen the data as well. So you can have this flexibility with these methods. And I think that's flexibility we want in practice all the time. And we've been living with statistics for 80 years, which doesn't give us that flexibility. Um, so, uh, but then of course, base is no better. Because Bayes doesn't need this a priori knowledge of your sampling plan or of your loss function, because you condition on the data, you can take any loss function you like, which may also depend on the data. But Bayes, in a way, uh, assumes that you have perfect knowledge about the underlying structure of your data, the underlying model. And I think this paper by Ian and Aditya is the perfect way of showing that that is, I'm sorry to say, but in some sense, it's, it can be really rather crazy. If you want to solve the problem, that Alicia has talked about, just learning the mean in IID data, uh, and you know that it's bounded, it's a very, very simple problem. But if you're Bayesian, you would have to put a prior on all IID distributions, whether they have densities or not, it, the prior has to cover everything. That is one serious overkill when in fact you can do with putting a prior. So we do use Bayesian techniques, but we interpret them very differently. You put a prior on just one parameter, instead of a huge infinite dimensional set. That's good enough. And you can always do that in these approaches. Uh, and so that's, I think, I really think this is the way forward. 
Um, so then let me end on a note that whenever we give these talks, people are always very much worried about, don't you give up too much power? Your confidence intervals will be wider. Um, you need more data to get the same power. Uh, how bad is it? Well, given the time, I will stop here, but I will just say that uh, if you really embrace this optional stopping idea, then it's actually not so bad. And there are also more and more papers coming up about that. And that's what I had to tell you. So with this, I would like to propose the vote of thanks. Yeah, I'd like to call on Gergi Noy to second the vote of thanks. All right, hello everybody. <clears throat> Okay, so I, I also have to start with an apology. I've, uh, I'm recovering from chairing a conference, uh, which should not affect my voice, but in reality, I managed to catch a very bad cold, but now I'm recovering. It's not uh, contagious, but uh, well, recovering, okay? <laughs> so sorry about that. Uh, <clears throat> and I also want to thank uh, the organizers for putting this uh, event together and for inviting me, for trusting me to, uh, to speak at this uh, reputable uh, institution. Uh, I come from a rather different community. I work in uh, machine learning theory and uh, mostly in the theory of uh, sequential decision making, which is uh, in principle something that should be very different from statistics and should be covering topics that are very different from mean estimations and topics like this. But uh, this wonderful paper connected these two areas in a very surprising way that uh, made me very interested in these topics as well. And I wanted to share, well, some of my insights or some of my views uh, regarding this uh, regarding this perspective. So uh, I understand that I have to start with appraisal, which is really not hard because this is really wonderful work, uh, as we have seen already from Aditya's presentation and from, from Peter's appraisal. So what, the, <clears throat> so what this paper has essentially done, in my view, was a non-asymptotic extension of uh, a certain connection that has already been known uh, about betting and probability and betting and expectations, and essentially extending the work uh, done by uh, Jean Ville back in uh, the 30s, and then uh, my Schaefer and Bob early in the 2000s that connected these two areas. And uh, what is uh, what what is really nice about these contributions is that uh, they are really practical, so they are both very satisfying uh, from a theoretical perspective, but also uh, very satisfying from a practical perspective, giving a very tight confidence bands. Uh, and uh, and all around the paper is very well explained and illustrated nicely with numerical simulations. So, so it's all great. And in my mind, really the big conceptual contribution is uh, is connecting these two areas of sequential decision making and uh, and, and estimation. But I understand that uh, that I also need to criticize the authors a little bit. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be doing that as mm -hmm. well. Uh, so this is the setup that we have seen before, right? So this is uh, the sequential game that is being considered uh, by the authors. So <clears throat> it's a sequential game when in each round uh, there is a player that picks a bet that's in a given interval, and then the wealth uh, of the of the of the better uh, gets updated according to this process over here. And then you have to simply consider the the set of games in which you have not made much too much money as your confidence in interval to work with. Right, so, so 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 let me then uh, get into my criticism, so to say, uh, because I understand from the tradition that this is what I need to do, or this is what I was, I was invited for. Uh, well, I tried really hard. Okay, so let's see, let's see how far I got. So as uh, as Aditya has mentioned uh, in his talk, that there are some relationships between uh, between their methodology and uh, and the Chernoff method, which is. I would say the standard textbook way of proving conservation qualities that uh, that most people uh, so and uh, <laughs> all of these methods are based on constructing so-called test marking means mm -hmm. and then deriving uh, confidence intervals according. One proposed by the authors is this uh, this so-called wealth process, right, which has uh, expectation one uh, if the parameter that is uh, being tested equals mu, right? So in, uh, if m uh, equals mu, then uh, 
and then the expectation of this uh, of this wealth process is simply one. And then uh, the authors criticize this uh, traditional view uh, that's based on the chernoff kramer method, uh, where, for example, uh, Huffington's inequality can be interpreted from uh, from this perspective as well, uh, using a test super martingale, right? Constructing this process M T of M that is uh, that is defined using this. Okay, I'll, I'll, I should not be using this pointer, but uh, so it. Uh, it's a it's a process. Oh yeah, okay, never mind. No, I don't know. I'm just going to point my finger. Yeah, I guess that's the easiest. So so uh, sort of sort of classical way of proving concentration inequalities is using this term of Kramer method, which uh, essentially uses uh, the log cumulant generating or, or the log moment generating function or the cumulant generating function to construct a similar martingale. Uh, and uh, what is known about this is that when uh, uh, n equals mu. So, which means that uh, uh, the the two data generating, data generating process uh, is the one that is being used uh, in this construction. Then this process has uh, has uh, an expectation that is upper bound. So this is a super bounding. Uh, and then this uh, this looseness, according to the arguments of the authors, uh, propagates to the confidence width. And for this reason, or anything that is based on the chernoff kramer method is going to re result in loose bounds because uh, essentially the looseness is encoded uh, in the way uh, of how this lambda squared over eight uh, constant is being chosen over there. But uh, so so what I, what I kept thinking about as I was uh, as I was reading the paper and the related papers is that okay, but is this problem inherent really to this uh, chernoff kramer method? Is this is this Really has to be so loose. Uh, so, uh, so if you take a closer look, then the actual correct way to apply the churn of Kramer method is to define the cumulant generating function, which is one over lambda, the logarithm of uh, e to the e to uh, lambda times x minus m. For each m, you define uh, you define this quantity, and you can define again a test marking there, right? Which is no longer loose, right? Uh, here, what is essentially happened is that I just replaced in the pro previous formula uh, the bound on the cumulant generating function, the lambda uh, lambda squared over eight, by the cumulant generating function itself, right? So this is a uh, so this is of course wonderful, and this is this is no longer loose, right? So like once m equals mu, the expectation of this. Uh, of this uh, thing that I can interpret as a, as a wealth processor that should that should have been LT of M, that's going to be exactly one. So everything should be fine. But of course, uh, this uh, this quantity is distribution specific, right? So this is only something that you can that you can that is a workable solution for parametric families, right? in particular families with only a single parameter. So this is uh, this is the power of this betting view, uh, as I eventually convinced myself, right? That uh, that uh, really the only other way that I can think of for constructing tight super martingales or, or tight test martingales is using this betting view. The churn of Kramer method is not going to take you too far, um, only, only only this far. Still, I will uh, I will say that it would have been very interesting to see a comparison for parametric families. So if you apply this method and perform all of the calculations that you have done for your betting martingale and compare the resulting confidence intervals how does your method method hold up i would expect this method to uh, to be a lot tighter than what you end up with and i think it would have been very informative this thing of this in a paper as well okay so that's uh, that's that's one piece of uh, of criticism another one is uh, okay is this methodology really suitable for iid data so the entire construction is based on uh, a sequential game, right? Processing the data points one by one, making making bets using data that you have seen in the past, right? And then making your bets according to that. Uh, but if my data is IID, then this is not a really sensible, uh, or, or this is not like a very intuitive thing to do. And this introduces a sequential aspect into the problem that is not inherently there. So the authors do uh, present uh, uh, a methodology for avoiding this. Which is the following? Let's just shuffle the data a couple of times, uh, perform the procedure on all of these shufflings, and then just take the average of the statistics that uh, that you calculate. But is this really the right answer? Is this really a satisfying answer, uh, or is this a fundamental limitation of this method? So so far we have seen, we have heard wonderful things about this methodology that uh, that Peter has been mentioning and you have been mentioning. Uh, but I have to say that this is uh, something that suggests that. 
well, maybe this is not the ultimate answer for all of your questions related to mean estimation, or I, I, I don't really know if you can do like anything that is like more, more satisfying and feels more right for IID data. So this is, so this is another uh, uh, thing that I would mention on the, on the side of criticism. How much it is right. Okay. So, so then maybe I'm going to make this final comment. So, uh, so what I found relatively unsatisfying regarding the paper is that uh, some I feel that uh, establishing the connection between betting and mean estimation is a wonderful contribution. And, uh, and, and in particular, this betting view is feels very fundamental and, uh, and, and beautiful. But still, uh, I was relatively disappointed to see that what the authors ended up using was uh, rather a heuristic method. So this uh, grappa method uh, that, uh, that has been highlighted here in the talk or the method that has been uh, highlighted as the main contribution in the paper is arguably not the most uh, the most fundamental way of approaching the problem. Uh, as you have said, uh, you just take the gradient, you make it equal to zero, and then just replace all of the all of the statistics with the empirical means, which may or may not work. Coming from the online learning community, I know that this strategy can backfire in very unexpected ways, and you can end up uh, with terrible performance. Uh, for certain data realizations as well. So, so, so maybe there is uh, some more work to be done on this front. And this is where I need to mention that, uh, that uh, uh, this uh, uh, limitation has been addressed very, very well in the concurrent work by Fang Sung John and Francesco Rabona. Uh, and these are really, as far as I know, simultaneous uh, work uh, done, by, uh, done by colleagues that are coming from the direction of online learning. Uh, and their idea has been to use, uh, has been to use uh, betting strategies that are known to be near optimal in certain scenarios. And this near optimality guarantee propagates uh, all the way through the, the conference with as well. So I, find this, uh, I find this approach to be very promising. And I hope that uh, that, uh, that the work that has been presented here is going to inspire further progress like that. Okay, so I, I have some remarks regarding related work. I'm probably going to be skipping that. Maybe I'm just going to mention that I myself have been interested in problems like this. And I think relations between online learning and statistics are going to be discovered more and more in the next uh, in the next years. So I'm very excited about this topic myself. Uh, well, I'm referring to a paper that the authors should have cited. This is a paper by myself that is going to be posted on archive during this week. So I'm not going to criticize the authors very hard about this. <laughs> All right. Okay. So this is uh, so this is really my conclusion here. Uh, beautiful work. Uh, very exciting techniques. Uh, uh, I really think that these results are very strong and encouraging. The initial results. That there's a lot of work to be done in terms of going beyond IID data. Uh, using better strategies for betting, uh, going beyond bounded data, which is another interesting question uh, that is addressed by the churn of Kramer method, but not addressed uh, by the by the framework that you have considered. And uh, and also, I'm very excited uh, personally about finding out more connections between online learning and betting. And uh, and I probably don't know the proper terminology, but uh, seconding the vote of thanks, I have um, my own terminology here, which is um, just uh, congratulations to the mm -hmm. members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much to all three presenters for uh, really interesting, fascinating, and insightful talks. So now I'd like to propose that, as per our tradition, uh, we mark the excellence of these this paper with applause. OK, we'll now move on to the discussion. Um, and our first speaker is someone who's joining us online. Just to remind you all, uh, everyone who's discussing gets five minutes. And uh, I will try and enforce that relatively strictly. Uh, and our first speaker um, is Rudu Wang from the University of Waterloo, Canada. Thank you very much for including me in this discussion. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate the authors for um, completing this paper. I knew this paper for quite a long time. Uh, actually, I have, I have attended, I think, several talks by both uh, uh, Adidia and Ian, I think maybe more than six times. And every time I still learn 
uh, a lot of new things. So it really was a pleasant journey. Um, so today I wanted to just mention, I think, two things that are related to this paper and also to the field. And as some of you know that I work on mathematical finance. So basically, I'm interested in mathematics and finance. So I have two uh, comments, from one from math and one from finance. Um, so as some of you know that here I have a picture that we took last year uh, with um, this one to France, um, who we all know. And uh, it's very nice to see that this field has developed very well over the past several years. We're having conferences, as you mentioned some, and it has a lot of connections to a lot of uh, interesting topics in, uh, in various different fields. And uh, as we can see in the paper, um, a general protocol is to build an e-process for each parameter theta that looks like these. Here I'm writing this in a very abstract way because uh, this function f can be relatively general. And here I have the data up to time s uh, using the same notation as in Aditya, but of course the uh, parameter here I'm choosing is theta instead of mu. And then you have a lambda parameter to choose, uh, which also was the lambda in uh, Aditya's talk. Uh, and here the, the main thing is that this lambda has to be predictable and also this uh, f will result as a what we call a sequential E variables. So that means their expected value given the past sigma field is precisely equal to one or less or equal to one. Right? So this is the sort of the general protocol to use, which can be uh, which can be used to uh, to construct E processes, and also uh, if you like, you can call them super martingales. In uh, of course, uh, Aditya has uh, established in a few papers the difference between uh, E uh, processes and super martingales. But here, uh, of course, uh, super martingale is probably more familiar to some of us. Um, so then, uh, I have a sort of a reverse abstract question. Um, so suppose that here we have found a way to construct this sequential e variable, and then we wonder whether there's a way to combine them into one e variable to make a decision. So that question is: we have those sequential e variables without knowing the model behind it. So we don't we throw away the information of the model, and then we ask whether there's a way to combine them just into one. And here we're not assuming that we need some anytime validity. So we're not building consequence uh, 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 confidence sequences. We're only needing this this one uh, outcome. And this will be called SE merging, right? So using the, the previous uh, slide and also using section four of the paper, so the idea was that basically building this uh, E process that, looking, that, that looks like this, right? So you have a function, here is just a weighted combination of your E variable and a betting strategy, right? So this is the same as done in the paper. And what we find, which I think is quite interesting, is that even in this simple framework where we don't require anything that is um, anytime valid, you eventually would get this martingale merging function that is in section four of um, of the paper. So basically, this martingale emerging function is the only thing that we could use. Anything else is dominated by one of them. So that means this anytime validity is sort of built in in this uh, if you already have sequential variables. But of course, this is not so surprising. But mathematically, I think it's quite nice. Uh, this comes from a joint work with uh, with uh, Vladimir Wolk. And you can see that most of the commonly used emerging functions are the average product or use statistics, and they are all uh, special cases of such morning going emerging function. But this becomes very different when you have independent uh, e variables. So if you replace the uh, sequential e variables by independent variables, then because you have the stronger property of independence, you actually have more choices of possible merging functions. And the problem becomes much more different in this situation. And the admissible merging methods no longer necessarily based, are no longer necessarily based on particles. So I think this also relates a little bit to the previous uh, discussion where the question was whether this method is specifically designed for IID. And I also have some doubts there because when I, I indeed have independence, I should be able to use it. And that seemed to give me a bit more room that allows me to go up, uh, go away from this martingale based method. Uh, so here I have a preprint that you might check. And the last comment comes from finance. So here in this paper and, and a few related papers, and uh, methods like grappa or a, a grappa, they use empirical or sample mean variance or include distribution to design the backing strategy, which is very natural. I think this is the, the thing that you can do and you should do. But this seems to suggest that your data should have some kind of stationarity, some kind. You don't have to have them to, to be strictly or whatever uh, sharp notion of stationarity, but this should be similar or predictable, 
you can use them to build a model to predict what's going on. But in financial applications, which I work on, uh, it's very difficult to assume such stationarity. You could have all kinds of different situations where uh, you have strange behavior or in the right-hand side, on the right-hand side, you have the real, uh, real data application. So you basically do not have much of a, a pattern. Uh, for instance, the question that we're interested in is back testing some kind of risk measures such as the expect purple, which is used to compute uh, regulated capital for banks. And how do we back test these things? They don't have stationarity and we actually are super interested in when, say, financial crisis happens. There's, of course, no stationarity. You can also use the positive to predict what's going on during financial crisis. But that's exactly when you want to be able to reject bad methods for risk estimation. So um, this problem is partially addressed in uh, my new uh, preprint with um, Chu Chi Wang and Johanna Siegel. And we realized that using uh, just the grappa or uh, some other uh, growth optimal methods are not enough. So we propose something new and uh, you have to check uh, these papers for this uh, for these operations. So uh, these are my comments and I do see that this field will develop even more and there are so many open questions and different areas of application. And I really am I'm really excited about it. And as Adi mentioned, we already have some conferences and we'll have more workshops in the future. And please um, join us if you're interested. And once again, I want to congratulate the authors for uh, this wonderful uh, paper. Thank you. OK, our next speaker is Anastasios Angrilopoulos from the University of California at Berkeley. Hello from Berkeley, California. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. London is one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, and congratulations uh, to Ian and Aditya. The paper is wonderful. Um, I'm giving a little presentation. The sort of formal title is Martingale Concentration and Artificial Intelligence. Um, so I work a lot in like computer vision and related areas um, and the intersection with statistics. So I'll talk about how I found their work to be useful there. But the real title of the talk, the unofficial title of the talk is the WSR bound, which is what I've been calling it in the papers that I've been writing. That stands for Wadby Smith and Ramdas. Um, so yes, you have an inequality named after you now, at least <laughs> when I write about it. Um, and it's called my favorite concentration inequality. Okay, so I'll tell you why I love this concentration inequality so much. First, I'll tell you how I came about it. So why do I use the WSR inequality? Um, well, it's, I work on sort of areas that are related to conformal prediction, and, and one of them is this high probability version of conformal called risk controlling prediction sets. And this is joint work with these folks at Berkeley, Stephen Lee, Kwaja Tender, and Mike. Um, and the idea of a risk controlling prediction set is we're going to produce prediction sets that don't just have coverage, right? So coverage is what you'd get via a technique like conformal. But instead, you want prediction sets that um, control some risk. So, you know, if you have some CT or MRI of a patient's head and you're trying to diagnose their disease, well, there might be some diseases that are high risk and some that are low risk. Um, and what you want is for the prediction set to um, sort of adapt to the risk in such a way that, you know, for a particular patient, what happens is that uh, the, the risk of any pr bad outcome is pretty low, okay? So, you know, the cost of missing a stroke might be higher than the cost of missing a concussion or something, right? cost of missing cancer might be very high. Um, so you want set prediction sets that are going to, you're going to be able to give them to the doctor and they're going to contain a set of diagnoses that are, you know, if they go and pursue all those diagnoses and they verify that none of them are the case, then the patient is going to have pretty low risk, right? Things landing outside of the, the set have a low probability times loss, okay? Um, and so just in terms of notation, we'll call these prediction sets T sub lambdas. T sub lambda of X size and lambda you can think about as indexing the set size. Um, and then what we'll say a risk controlling prediction set does is it's this random function T sub lambda hat where lambda hat is the size it gets chosen by a conformal type method. Um, and the probability of the risk is low is low. OK, so the risk level is alpha. You set that. You say, I, I don't want my risk to be less than 0.05 with probability at least 99 percent. Right. So there's a risk level and a tolerance level, the tolerance set. Um, which is an idea that many of you have heard of. Okay, so why am I using WSR for this? Well, the way that you construct these risk controlling prediction sets is by basically like traversing an upper confidence bound. Okay, so there's the set size parameter. As it grows, your risk shrinks. But what you want to do is you want to sort of like travel up and down until you reach the smallest set that's going to control your risk. 
Um, and the long story short is this R hat plus this uh, upper confidence bound on the risk. Um, that's where I use WSR. OK, so let me just show you some practical results of how this is useful. Um, so uh, yes. Yeah, what would you say? Two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah, you got it. So if the loss is distributed Bernoulli, um, I plotted a bunch of confidence bounds here. And the long story short is WSR is not that useful if your loss is Bernoulli with a small mean. But where it really shines is if you have these losses that are peaked, and then you can adapt to the standard deviation, and then you get these really good results. OK, so the confidence sequences are super small. Um, they, they're better than anything else that I've tried, better than Hufting, better than this bank kiss series of bounds, better than Bernstein. So the long story short is what you can do with this is really cool like medical imaging tasks where you set these where you can do like Im automated image segmentation in a way that you bound, you know, the amount of tumor that's cut out of the patient. Right. So you can like if you're doing tumor segmentation, you can segment just enough so you capture the tumor, but not too much. But if you don't use WSR, use something like Huffington, you get these crazy wild, you know, wacky sets where the statistics has been useless because it tells you something trivial. Um, so we've done this in all sorts of applications. Uh, it's been a workhorse inequality for me and my work. Um, and I want to thank uh, Aditya and Ian for coming up with it because it's awesome. So that's the point of my presentation. And th that's actually the last slide. So I'll just <laughs> stop sharing now. Thank you very much. Um, right. Does anyone else? wish to contribute. If you do, please raise your hand or uh, use the raise hand feature if you're on Teams. See anyone on Teams who's raised their hand. OK, then I think uh, it's now uh, Time for our honorary secretary Heather to read out some written contributions that have been submitted. Okay, very good. Uh, so, in accordance with tradition, I'll read out uh, the written contributions. We've received four of these. Uh, some of them are a little technical, so I'm not going to read all the equations, um, but I'll do my best to summarize uh, what's in here. Um, so the first contribution is from uh, Heim Nguyen, Nguyen, thank you, uh, from uh, School of Mathematics and Physics, University of Queensland, uh, who writes, I would like to congratulate and thank the authors for their comprehensive work on non-parametric, anytime valid confidence sets for the mean of bounded random variables. When performing statistical inference, a general expectation is that parametric procedures, when available for the same task, will typically be more efficient than non-parametric equivalents. To assess this conjecture, I consider the use of the universal inference procedure from uh, reference one, which is uh, Wasserman and Zondas, Krishnan, 2020, um, to generate any time valid confidence sets for the mean parameter. Uh, there follows some uh, elaborate mathematics, um, <laughs> followed by um, the conclusion that uh, to make comparisons to the author's approach, I apply the un uh, what's it, universal inference procedure to obtain a confidence sets for the mean of beta distributions with parameters alpha and beta equal to both equal to one. Um, okay. Uh, comparisons with uh, the confidence sets constructed using theorems two and three are presented in figure one. Uh, contrary to expectations, the author's methods appear to provide far more efficient confidence sets when alpha and beta are equal to one. However, there may be some justification for parametric methods in the low variance and as asymmetric case. Uh, never nevertheless, the validity of uh, the uni uniform Sorry, no, universal, universal inference confidence set depends on the beta distribution of the data, while the author's techniques remain uh, non parametrically robust. Um, again, uh, I'll skip the next bit. Um, details of uh, what I've done here. Um, figure two shows comparisons with the universal inference confidence sets. Although less efficient, I must note again that the non parametric uh, confidence sets are robust and remain valid for data arising from any distribution having fixed conditional mean and variance. Okay. Um, second contribution is by uh, Martin 
Larson and Johannes Ruff uh, from uh, Carnegie Mellon and London School of Economics, respectively, uh, who write, we congratulate Ian Warbury smith and Aditya Ramdra Ramdas on their comprehensive and insightful paper. The authors construct uh, time uniform confidence sequences for the mean of a sequence of zero, one random have the same conditional mean, assumed to be deterministic. Um, okay, specifically for fix M in zero, one and define uh, this to be uh, the set of probability measures on the canonical se sequence space under which uh, for each T, the conditional expectation of XT given the history is equal to the deterministic number M. Um, the authors construct non-negative processes that satisfy uh, some conditions. Um, these martingales are then used to construct any time valid statistical tests that in turn can be transformed into confidence sequences. Um, in keeping with the game theoretic probability literature, the authors refer to the processes as capital processes. And then um, the, the, the authors of this discussion go on to discuss the terminology um, related to this in, in terms of a, a quantity, which, which I think was the, the wealth of the game, in, oh, sorry, wealth in game, Aaron, as, you, as you presented it. Um, so they write, one may interpret uh, this parameter lambda t as the proportion of one's capital that is invested in an, in an asset with return uh, xt minus m, keeping what, whatever is left over in the pocket. In fact, uh, lambda t can be greater than one, negative, or oh, sorry, or negative, this poses no issue, as this simply means that one may borrow cash uh, to purchase more of the asset than one could otherwise afford, or sell the asset short to generate additional cash income. Uh, crucially, one's capital must always remain non-negative. The upshot of this not only is process IT, the, the capital process produced by repeated betting, thanks to the representation one, which was like the wealth in this M, um, and there is always an explicit trading strategy operating on one single asset that generates the capital process. Um, I shall skip the rest. <laughs> A third contribution. This is by uh, Rong Jiang and uh, Ming Yu at uh, Shanghai Polytechnic and uh, Brunel University, respectively. Uh, they say uh, we want to congratulate the authors on estimating means of bounded random variables in both with and without re replacement settings. The authors constructed confidence intervals and time uniform uh, confidence sequences for the mean of a bounded random variable using test super scale technique. Um, we offer three comments. Now, um, <laughs> there are some equations here. Um, they were right. It is not clear um, if so many parameter estimators will lead to the superposition of errors and the failure of the method. Whereas the Hofting process in equation eight, that's equation eight of your paper, uh, only needs uh, one lambda. Um, they speak about some simulations that they've done and, and then write, we wonder if theorem two needs some restrictions on T. Uh, they ask whether certain quantities are sensitive to C, uh, lowercase c, uh, and if so, how do you select C? So in, in the paper, um, one half or three quarters is recommended. Second comment, uh, the author, authors mentioned that test super martingale can be inverted to get a confidence sequence for any quantile. How about a confidence sequence for uh, mode? And then third, the authors consider arbitrary distribution, but bounded, but bounded distribution, which implies all moments exist and require a Chernoff type assumption on the distribution resulting in order uh, square root log t over t shrinkage rate confidence sequences. Recently, Wang, Wang and Ramdas 2023 show that employing Katoni's estimator improves the rate to order 
very log log 2t over t under weaker assumptions on the distribution. Now we wonder if the methods and results can be generalized to unbounded observations, since the sigma squared bounded variance assumption is more realistic and easier to verify. Final uh, discussion is by uh, Philip, Philip Stark at the University of California, Berkeley. He writes, uh, this paper is a gem and I predict it will have lasting impact on the theoretical and applied statistics. Drawing on intellectual heritage spanning more than eight years, illustrating and leveraging deep connections among results in probability finance, information theory, computer science and statistics, Warbury Smith and Ramdas present mature, intuitive, flexible, computable and powerful methods for two fundamental, indeed canonical, non-parametric inference problems. The conservative confidence bounds for the expected value of a bounded random variable from IID observations and conservative confidence bounds for the mean of a finite bounded, po bounded population from a simple random sample. Sequentially valid methods have been proposed for these problems and the related problem of conservative tests for non-negative or bounded means, including some based on Biles inequality, uh, explicitly or through Wall's sequential probability ratio test, but their performance varies and their de derivations provide little insight into how to sharpen the methods. In contrast, the betting martingale framework leads naturally to techniques that approximately optimize power, are computationally tractable, perform well out of the box for a broad range of bounded populations and distributions, and can, can incorporate prior information without compromising coverage. Moreover, the sequential validity makes them safe against common pra practices that invalidate other approaches. Uh, for instance, optimal stopping and optional continuation. Um, for the fixed sample size case, it would be interesting to compare these new methods uh, to the confidence bound of eight, reference eight, which is uh, Fan, Thomas and Leonard Miller. to the conjectured bound of Gafka and Leonard Miller and Thomas, even though the latter has not been proved to be valid in general. Accommodating Bernoulli sampling is trivial, but tied to the question of de-randomization, especially in the fixed sample size case. Accommodating stratified sampling using union intersection cases is straight Sorry, union intersection tests is straightforward because independent E values can be combined by multiplication or averaging. Alternatively, the E values can be converted to P values and then combined. Optimizing union intersection bounds based on test martingales yields an interesting generalization of the multi arm bandit problem of gang of bandits, where N multi arm bandits, ban bandits are probed in parallel. At each stage, the statistician chooses an arm which pulls the same arm of all n multi-armed bandits as if they were ganged, like switches. Uh, the statistician has a fortune for each multi-armed band bandit and bets separately on each, but seeks to maximize their minimum fortune across the bandits uh, by choosing the sequence of arms and bets. Improved methods for stratified inference have immediate applications ranging from election audits and financial aud audits to randomized experiments with blocking. In closing, I highly recommend Appendix F for a brief history of connections among gambling, portfolio theory, martingales, concentration inequalities, and hypothesis testing. Uh, so that's all of them. Uh, the discussion contributions will be online fairly soon, so you'll be able to read, read them in full all the Thank you. Right. Uh, so as we're now coming to the end of the discussion meeting, I'd like to invite the authors to respond to some or the discussion. It's entirely optional. You have up to 10 minutes to do so. Okay. Um, firstly, we'd like to thank all of the discussants. Uh, uh, Peter and Gerke, who gave the vote of thanks, those who were online and the written ones. Many of them made very insightful comments. I have a few notes and Ian has a few notes, so 
maybe we'll we can take turns uh, commenting on each of those. We might not make it all the way to the end. Uh, Peter mentioned something really interesting, which was. Uh, which I think is still worth exploring further. In Peter's paper, there's this notion called regrow, which is uh, you know uh, relatively growth rate optimal, and uh, the relationship of grappa to regrow I think is is going to be an interesting one. Um, you mentioned that grappa is approximately regrow, and that's my feeling too is that grappa should be approximately regrow. Uh, this is somehow related to Gerke's comment about um, you know why these betting strategies in in these kind of simple in like you need more sophisticated betting strategies when you're facing adversarial data. But when your data is known to have constant mean, and you know you can approximately think of it almost as IID data, it turns out that follow the regularized data does perfectly fine. And our empirical mean and empirical variance plugins are smooth. So you should think of them as something like what Krzyzewski Trofimov is doing with um, with a smooth empirical mean estimator, uh, like you know, using a, like a Jeffrey Spry kind of to smooth it. Our empirical mean and empirical variance estimator is also smooth. So there, there, there's some kind of um, variance adaptive KT estimators, and we do actually expect them to be optimal in this setting. And I think that's what Peter also has been hinting at that, that Grappa already is approximately growth rate optimal or relatively growth rate optimal in, in our setting, um, which is not adversarial. So you actually don't need uh, more techniques. Um, another question with respect to optimality is actually very subtle. Um, the thing that you're trying to optimize is actually the width of the confidence sequence. This is actually not in any of the, any from co portfolio theory work by Kova or, you know, Urbona and Jun's recent work and things of that kind. Turns out that uh, optimizing widths or powers of tests is not the same thing as optimizing wells. There's a relationship, of course. If you if you if you do well in wealth, you'll you'll have a small width. But um, it turns out that you can prove that any of these material based techniques, they they don't uniformly dominate each other. Which means that methods that do well, which, which are tighter early on, might be loser later on, and methods that are tighter later on are loser earlier on. And the reason is that they all have a, a probability error of alpha over all of time. So if they're very tight early on, they're using more of their alpha budget early, which means they'll use less of their, uh, they'll have less later on. And so you, if you actually have to look at widths of confidence sequences, then the notion of optimality becomes even very hard to define. And so in an, another work, we define a notion of admissibility, which is a weaker notion than optimality. And there we show that any of these Martingale-based methods lead to admissible bounds. And, and in practice, what we find is the methods of Junin or Urbona on our own, they don't uniformly dominate each other, which means that some are loser early, some are loser later, but they're kind of, they're, they're all admissible methods. They're just based on different betting strategies. And so in, in, I, my, my takeaway currently still is, there's a variety of betting strategies that lead to like you know incomparable in general techniques, but all of which are have the right weight, uh, but uh, but are not you know finite sample. One is better than the other, or something of that kind. But I'd be happy to discuss that more offline. Do you have any thoughts on? Uh, yeah, I wanted to just uh, respond to one thing that uh, Gary mentioned, which is that uh, he said it might be interesting to look at the case where you have a parametric family maybe, and you could have like these martingales for bounded random variables, but but compare them to one like specific sub problem of parametric family. So we didn't do this for the beta distribution. We did it for implicitly. We did it for um, Bernoulli distributions. And in that case, what ends up happening is that even if you were only interested in estimating the mean of Bernoulli P, so you want to estimate P for Bernoulli P, it turns out that if you compare them empirically, these bounds, they seem to to be like very favorable, they'll either match or beat the the parametric ones in that case. So in, in Hofding's original paper, in this 1963 paper, we often cite Hofding's inequality as the thing that was presented above as a sample average plus or minus something. But in fact, he has another bound, which is like a sub Bernoulli bound instead of a sub Gaussian bound. And that in fact is a martingale for all elements of the, uh, for, for all Bernoulli distributions. And even in that situation, these means of bound random variables betting type of martingales, they seem to match or beat. But it, what's interesting is that these also work outside of that setting. Um, so that was just one thing I wanted to mention. And the reason for this observation is also clear is because the, these betting based methods are likelihood ratio, be, likelihood ratio based methods in disguise anyway. So if you had a parametric problem, you would use likelihood ratio martingales and use those to construct confidence sequences. The betting based are likelihood ratios in disguise. So they're typically going to perform just as well for those problems as well. Um, uh, Rudu mentioned some interesting questions on, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, merging uh, e-value-based functions, and in particular, he said 
you know, the, the grappa method kind of uh, maybe it's implicitly hoping that the data is stationary. Um, but, you know, what if it's not and, and in financial data, it might not be. And I think this comes back to Peter's notion of you are allowed to be a Bayesian while betting. And so um, if you have prior knowledge about the structure of your data or how you might even anticipate your data to change, you're allowed to use that while betting. It does not violate the validity of the resulting confidence sequences, um, but it affects power. If, you're, if, you're, if your prior was correct, you, your method will be more powerful. If your prior was incorrect, you'll still get valid answers, but you, you might have slightly wider confidence intervals, things of that kind. So, um, um, but I, I agree that taking particular non-stationary cases and de designing particular betting strategies for those cases is uh, could be interesting for future work. Um, any, do you have any thoughts on Rulus or? No, uh, with Anastasios, I mean, uh, thanks a lot for, uh, that wonderful, wonderful set of pictures. Now I can actually tell people that, you know, there was a bit of tumor, identifying tumors, risk prediction sets, things of that kind. So now game theoretic statistics can save lives, mm -hmm. which is uh, not something that most people can say. So yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to see that uh, some of our work is being used in, in, in vision and maybe in real world settings. And, uh, and theoretical statistics is having quite quickly some impact on the real world. So thanks for that, Anastasios. Um, on the... Uh, written comments, uh, I guess it was interesting to see. I, I guess I haven't seen the plot of comparing the beta distribution with the universal, universal inference to our method, but um, Nguyen seems to find that uh, our method is competitive with uh, uh, and sometimes better than parametric methods, which which I think is interesting. Again, it's because it's a Martin, it, it's a likelihood ratio based method. Um, uh, Martin and Johannes, I, I think, made made some technical comments, but I didn't follow them fully. Maybe I'll read and comment on them later. Did you have any thoughts on the Guyan or Martin that you want to share? In the interest of time, I'll just yeah. No. Right. Yeah. How about the last two? Yeah. So there was um sorry, I forget the, the exact authors, but there was there was a comment made about um one of the advantages of, of Hoofding's inequality being that you only need to choose one lambda. And and another advantage of this is that it's also a permutation invariant, meaning you don't need to do this de-randomization because it doesn't matter what order the data came in and it'll look the same. Um, one interesting thing that's in the appendix of the paper is actually that if you use the same lambda, or maybe not the same lambda, but if, you, if you're interested in a hoofding base bound and a betting base bound, you can actually show that for every hoofding lambda, there is a betting lambda that will dominate the hoofding one uh, eventually. So um, from that point of view, uh, you, can, you can have those advantages that you like in hoofding in the betting situation as well, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that because then it's not going to have these adaptivity properties and things of that sort. Yeah, I think those authors also mentioned uh, these, um, like several authors mentioned moving beyond the bounded case. I think Gerke mentioned moving beyond the bounded case and Rong and Shiming mentioned these Katoni styles of Martingale. So yeah, so this paper worked in the bounded case, but but if you're interested in unbounded random variables, there's several other papers. There's a Howard et al. 2021 paper that handles sub-Gaussian, sub-exponential tails, which are unbounded distributions, including heavy-tailed ones with only two moments or three moments and so on, symmetric unbounded random variables. And the one that he mentioned, Katoni style super Martin Gales, it adapts Katoni's method from 10 years ago into this game theoretic framework to produce confidence sequences. The setting over there is you just have a mean and a variance. It's unbounded distribution with only two moments, but you get sub-Gaussian style confidence sequences. The catch there is you need to know an upper bound on the variance. So you need to know this sigma parameter. It is not possible to adapt to the variance in, in those types of unbounded settings. The advantage of these methods is they are variance adaptive for free. So uh, some pros and cons. So you can extend these all of these techniques to unbounded distributions, but, but sometimes you need to know an additional uh, parameter. And that's fundamental. That's not fundamental for these methods. You can show that you cannot estimate the mean of a random variable with finite variance without knowing a bound of the variance. That's just a fundamental uh, you know, impossibility result dating back to Bahadur and Savage from 1956. Um, and so all of our methods inherit those impossibility results as well. And then, yeah, Philip Stark mentioned uh, connections to election auditing. The sampling without replacement is useful in election auditing. And, and we also have some uh, work with Philip uh, on applying these betting techniques to election auditing. Actually, a couple of years ago, it won the best paper award at an electronic voting conference. And so it seems to yield the best uh, risk limiting uh, election audits in, in practice when you take our without replacement methods and you, and you translate it to the auditing setup, it, it seems to do really well in practice. So yeah, I, I, I'm glad that uh, Philip liked this work and and yeah, I don't know if you had any other comments on Philip or others. Uh, yeah, I know that was uh, that's a great, yeah, great discussion. Well, oh, one last thing I wanted to mention was uh, Philip mentioned it would be interesting to compare these to 
some methods by GAFK, which don't necessarily have guaranteed coverage, but then there's a related bound of uh, MIFAN and uh, Thomas and Learned Miller. And that is that is a very interesting bound. Um, it came out just over six months after our paper and and it does really well in practice. Uh, but it, one, one difference there is that it actually requires, to the best of my knowledge, IID data, whereas in this case we just require this like martingale dependence or more generally independence. So you might have random variables that that one is one is discrete, one is continuous, one is a mixture of the two. But as long as they have the same mean, you can derive confidence intervals and sequences for them. The the fan at all paper is for confidence intervals for one IID sequence of distributions because it's fundamentally based on CDFs. But um, and and ours still seems to either be competitive or or beat it in in all the situations that we looked at. And it uh, came out after that, our work, but we incorporated it is in the paper. It is yeah. in our paper in the simulations. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you all again. That brings us to the end of the discussion meeting. Um, so the next discussion meeting is going to be on the 27th of June. Um, full details will be on the RSS website, in the members' newsletters, and on Twitter. And if you want to be informed personally about all future discussion meetings, then please email journal at rss.org.uk to get added to the distribution list. Thanks very much, everyone.